blessing. I, if you like me, I couldn't wait to start the day, the service. Amen. What a blessing. So good to see so many faces, guests and family. Welcome. We love you. We're glad we get to serve a risen Savior. Amen. Every day is a, ri- a blessing to serve him. Thank you for being here. Hymn 36. Hymn 36. Let's stand and sing Christ arose. Christ arose. <laughs> Good to see you, preacher. We love you. Glad you're with us today. Brother Turner, you pray for us this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the death, the resurrection, the life, the life of the Thank you, Brother Turner. Good to see all of you this morning. Thank you, congregation and choir, for that song about our risen, living Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. We're here on Sunday meeting because he got out out of that grave on the very first day of the week, and we're thankful for that. We want to welcome all of you that are visiting today. I uh, wish we had time to name and go around and see each and every one, but family, friends that are here today, uh, we welcome you and we're glad that you're here. Uh, you that are joining us online, we appreciate you being with us today and trust the message, the singing will be a blessing to your heart. Now, I can't recognize all the visitors, but I need to recognize a few. Uh, my grandson, Jake, his wife, Brandy's here today, and back there somewhere I have my great-grandson. Now, he don't talk much, but talk to him about baseball. 
it'll be an unending story. He got three out the first day, hit two balls. He'll, he'll tell you the whole story that are there. But what a joy and delight to have them. Amen. And if we had a gift for the visitor who came the farthest, I believe it would be Michelle's mom, Kathy Johnson, <laughs> who came all the way from Chicago to be here today. I hope you brought a pizza with you uh, that we could have while you're here. We love you, dear lady. Good to see you. We, we're thankful for all of you here today. Uh, we're glad for you being here in our church, being here for this service today. And we pray that God does something in your heart and your life uh, that will be helpful and changeful to each and every one of you that are here today. While our ushers come, remind you to pray for our country and our leaders, military and their families as we mention them every Sunday morning. Uh, first responders, law enforcement, firemen, and uh, also those medics that are out there. Sad to say, another law enforcement officer gave his life in service the other day in New York, and they were there that. So we need to pray for them and remember them in prayer. Uh, Brother Joyce, continue to pray for him. Uh, Sister Olson, you still have your appointment tomorrow? So let's pray for her. She has an important doctor's meet, uh, appointment tomorrow. Uh, pray for her. My niece, Kim Burnett, who's had a lot of health problems, April 4th will have an ultrasound, try to figure out where some of those problems are. are. Greg Militello, who needs some open heart surgery, pray for him to get stronger and better. Uh, Brother Sister Sharp's friend, the Powell family, who she's expecting a baby that they know already has some birth defects. So April 4th, I guess, is still set where they're going to do a C-section. Powell family, remember to pray for them. Sister Adair, are not here today. She has uh, bad pains with a kidney stone that she needs to pass. So remember to pray. I heard that ooh throughout the congregation that is there. Uh, how painful it is. Brother Roots here with us today, had his surgery. He goes to see his surgeon April 2nd. So pray for him. Uh, pray for his back, and that all will be well with that. Unspoken prayer request today. Uh, many hands raised. God sees and knows exactly why you raise that hand, what that prayer request is all about. He sees your hand, he knows, and he cares about what's going on in your life. Praise the Lord. Brother Turner had a great day in the Coffee County Jail uh, up near uh, Enterprise, Alabama, Great service. He had seven men to get saved in that service. And praise God for it. He said he had those guys come in, complete attention, and he said, if you ever try to preach in prison, to have all of them give you your complete attention uh, is an amazing thing. So you pray for him that God would continue to bless. And thanks to the Lions, Bryans, and all the helpers who had their um, uh, uh, day with the spring fling for the kids out there yesterday. They had a jump thing and a lot of things that are there and we appreciate them. Lord, we thank you for this Lord's Day, Resurrection Day, Easter Sunday Day, that you let us come and meet in church today. I pray you'd be with all the requests, spoken and unspoken, here and answer them according to your will. And I know there's a lot of people in the world who know about Easter, but I wonder if they know the person whom Easter is all about. They may celebrate it or commemorate it in different ways, but today, Ray, really, the real meaning of Easter reached their hearts. May they realize there's a person named Jesus Christ who loved them, who died for them, and was buried, but the story doesn't end there. He rose on the third day. He is a living, risen Savior who wants to be their Savior today. In church or online, let them know if they'll confess their sin Come to you, call on your name, and receive you that can be saved. And may we who are saved rejoice in the risen living Savior we have today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
job. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Thank you so much. Our choir is going to do the Hallelujah Chorus at this time. If you're able, if you're not, we understand. If you're able, would you please rise for this song? so worthy. It's wonderful. It's worthy. Thank you, Sister Lydia. Thank you, choir. They put a lot of time, effort. Our Lord is surely worthy. Amen. He's worthy. We're not perfect, but we sing about a perfect God, a perfect Redeemer, a perfect Savior. Amen. He is worthy of our praise. Thank you so much. Shake hands with those around you as our choir comes down. Some of you might not recognize. This is Brennan with a tie on the front. Muffle Sam in a suit back there. Jason Dempsey, I see him with a beard. Amen. Welcome those around you. Hymn 31. Hymn 31. Amen.
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, he does. Say for that first one. does hallelujah thank you so much you may be seated catch your breath amen sister lydia sister elizabeth sister esther gonna sing this morning amen thank you lord we've been we've been saying all morning that christ is risen and that's one of the most important truths that we believe in and this song actually takes a little bit of a warmer darker turn but also brings the light of resurrection into our daily lives. And so the piece is called, it's, It Is Not Death to Die. So what we're doing is taking all of this truth and realizing what it means for us. Amen. So when we die, we know we have the hope of resurrection if we put our trust in Christ.
ladies what a powerful song it is not death to die we may make a trip to the cemetery with our loved ones it may be the end of their earthly life but it's only the beginning of their eternal life they're absent from the body and present with the lord thank you for that wonderful wonderful music uh we appreciate the prelude and those who had a part in the offertory and we appreciate our choir they took so much time Lydia, Jerry, all the choir members practicing and singing that song. And we really, really do appreciate the music. Uh, hallelujah, that chorus is one of the most majestic, spiritual, uh, moving songs you'll ever hear. And thank God one day we'll be there, you and I that are saved, when they crown him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we might even be getting in on the Hallelujah Chorus. I get to heaven, get a sanctified body, I might get a sanctified voice, and they'll let me sing in that choir when I get there. But thank God for all the music, our musicians, everybody, and everything that they did, and all the part that they had in that special music today. Bibles are open this morning to Matthew chapter 27. Brother and Sister Martinez led their Philippine neighbors, is that right, brother, to the Lord? Uh, and we thank God for that. Brother Ellis just told me Dr. Waller, who him and his wife go on mission trips, and he's a medical doctor. We're in Kenya, Africa for a meeting. He had over 1,100 people get saved. Uh, what a great God that we have. God is still in the soul-saving business. These people are dealt with very carefully, very prayerfully, presented the plan of salvation, and we thank God for that. Today uh, is a day 
when we remember the greatest day in the history of the church and civilization, and that is Resurrection Day, and that is Easter Sunday. It is the greatest day, and it is the greatest doctrine in the church where we recognize the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as being a living Savior. We reflect on His death, burial, and resurrection, and we also rejoice in a Savior who died for us, was buried, and that He rose again. That He loves us, He cares about us, wants to be our Savior, and wants us to know Him in a real and personal way. In Matthew chapter 27, in verse 57, it says this, When the even was come, Matthew 27, 57, there came a man, a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a linen, clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed, the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. They knew exactly what he professed. They knew exactly the message that was there, and they were trying to deny it or derail it from happening. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say in the people he has risen from the dead, on the last, and the last error be worse than the first. Pilate saith unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way. He doesn't sound too convinced. Make it as sure as you can. I think Pilate dealt personally with Jesus so much that he knew what he said. So they went and made the sepulcher secure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. At the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and then kind of a neat note, and sat upon it. The angel just kind of there sitting, saying, see, we told you it's going to happen. And they're there sitting on that stone. His countenance is like lightning, his raiment white as snow, and for the fear of the keeper, him, the keepers did shake and became his dead man. The angel answered and said unto the woman, women, fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall we see him. Lo, I have told you. They descended quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. Last week I preached on the place called Calvary, the crucifixion and the cross. Today, as Paul Harvey used to say, I'm going to give you the rest of the story. I want to talk about the empty tomb of Jesus. The empty tomb of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, today for everybody who has come to church, visitors, family, friends, and folks that are here today. I appreciate we as a church appreciate them so much by being in church, honoring us with their presence and being here on this Easter Sunday to help us celebrate and commemorate not only the death and burial, but the resurrection of our Savior. Those that are joining us online, may you bless the Word of God spoken to them today. Be with any man, woman, young person, Sunshine Church, Junior Church, this church, here today, that is not saved, that they might look to you, trust you, and believe on you today. Bless the Word of God and help us to look to this living, risen Savior today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Who but God could take a graveyard and a cemetery and bring the greatest news the world has ever heard? Who but God could take a place that we normally associate with gloom and turn it into glory? A place where we shed tears, but God turns it into triumph. A place where we come with hearts that are broken, but he turns it into happiness in our life. Who but God could take the darkest night in the history of the church when Jesus was dead and in a tomb and dawned the brightest day in the history of the church. And I say to you, as they said on that first Easter Resurrection Sunday, He is not here, for He is risen as He said. Only God could do that. To deny the resurrection is to deny his deity, deny his life, and it is there. If there is no resurrection, we have no living Savior, we have no message, we have no faith. All that we do is futile and in vain. We have no one to trust, we have no hope, and of all men we are most miserable. Good news, the resurrection is real. Jesus got up out of that grave. He is risen as he said. He is alive. He is seated at the right hand of God, praying for you and for me today, and praying for us that if you don't know him as your Savior, today you'll come to know him. And if you do know him, you will rejoice in that. Jesus Christ is alive today. What is the importance of this day? This day is very spiritual, very special, and very significant. Think about it. If you went in any church in this area at all, I bet they'd be preaching on the resurrection. I don't bet, shouldn't use that. But anyway, uh, you'll be thinking of lottery and the billions you missed on it. But anyway, uh, by the way, if you do hit the lottery, remember ties belong to the Lord. Amen. (laughs) But you cannot think of any other Sunday in the world where people would be united in preachers and churches on one theme and on one message. Why is it so special? Why is it so significant? Why is it so spiritual that we celebrate and commemorate this day? I want you to think about the empty tomb of Jesus, and I want you to think about the mystery of the tomb. In the Bible, it says he was laid in his own new tomb. No tomb has been more talked about than the tomb of Jesus Christ. No tomb has been more discussed or debated or doubted or denied than the tomb of Jesus Christ. Even NBC will talk about the resurrection. That's getting pretty wild when that channel talks about Jesus at all. Uh, The world will look at that tomb that is there. And let me say, from atheist to agnostic to archaeologist, they all agree on one thing, Jesus' tomb is empty. They all agree on that fact that is there and is there. That tomb has mystified the world and mankind. Our Bible says it was a new tomb his own new tomb that was there, one that was already prepared for him. Let me tell you, salvation was not an afterthought to God. Salvation was not a second thought. This is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. This is the lamb that he said to Abraham, God will provide himself a lamb. This is the lamb that John said, Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This was all part of God's plan. It was all part of God's purpose. And it was all part of God's prophecy as well. The mystery of the tomb is that it was a new tomb. But let me give you this. The mystery of it was that it was a borrowed tomb. He had no tomb. It was Joseph of Arimathea's own new tomb. Can you imagine going to the funeral home and saying, I would like to rent a casket. I would like to rent a graveside. And I would like to rent a place there at the cemetery. 
It was borrowed. He had no tomb of his own. It was the most unique, unusual, unlike any others that is there. Why was it borrowed? He only needed it for three days and three nights. May I say hallelujah? May I say hallelujah? Every child of God who has died is living in a borrowed grave. They're not going to stay there. They're not going to stay in that ground. Every time I do a funeral of a saved person, I'll pause at that grave and say, Oh, grave, you can hold that body for a while. But guess what? You can't keep a good man down. That child of God is coming up from that grave. That child of God is going to live with him forever and forever. The mystery of the tomb. It was a new tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. It was an empty tomb. Think about it. There's only one tomb, one grave, that is significantly important because of who is not there. Every other graveyard, every other cemetery, every other sepulcher, every other mausoleum, every other place is noted by who is there. It is noted by the person that is there. The cemeteries, tombs, sepulchers all around this world have been memorialized by famous well-known people. The pyramids of Egypt have the mummified remains of Egyptian kings. Westminster Abbey, where my wife and I have been, a church that contains nobles and nobilities from days gone by. Arlington Cemetery, where I've also been, where those heroes are there that died. But I want you to know today, Mohammed's tomb is occupied. Confucius' tomb is occupied. Buddha's tomb is occupied. I want you to know every religious leader, every person that ever lived, their tomb is recognized and remembered because of who is there. Thank God the mystery of that tomb is the only tomb remembered and recognized and rejoiced because of who is not there. And that is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They say the embalmed remains of Lenin lie there in a crystal casket in Red Square in Moscow after he died. His body was there, a casket that all could see and all that could look at. He was a leader. His picture was there. And it said below his picture and below the casket, he was the greatest leader of all people, all countries, all nations. He was the Lord of a new humanity. He was the Savior of mankind. He was the greatest leader our country ever had. I like how they use the word was, was, was. That is not my Savior. Jesus said, I am he that liveth, was a dead, and I am alive forevermore. Amen and amen. amen. The mystery of this tomb, a new tomb, a borrowed tomb, and it was also, it was also an empty tomb. But the meaning of the tomb, getting right down to what the resurrection says, how significant it is to us here today, what it means to us and our faith and what we believe, why it's important. I want you to know the meaning of the tomb is it is the surety of His divine incarnation. The surety of His divine incarnation. It shows us that He was who He professed to be, God manifests in the flesh. It sets him apart from every human being that ever lived. It exalts him. It elevates him. It honors him. It pays homage to him. It separates him from everyone else and says to the world as the choir was singing, he is the God of God. He is the Lord of Lord. He is the King of King. I am, he said, the resurrection and the life. I am the prince of life. I am the way. I am the truth of life. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. It is, the, it is for sure the surety of his divine incarnation. But it is also the seal of his finished work. He was virgin born. Born as nobody else has ever born. He lived a virtuous life without any sin. 
He died a vicarious death on the cross of Calvary. But if it ended there, virgin birth, vicarious life, and, uh, and, and that, that resurrection that he died, that, that death that he gave for you and I, the virgin birth, the virtuous life, and vicarious death, only take meaning because of the victorious resurrection. It is the seal of a finished work. What started with the virgin birth ended with a visible, literal, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ seen above 500 eyewitnesses who wrote it down, recorded it, and said he is alive today. It is the showing of a glorious triumph of all the victors, of all the rulers, of all the kings and leaders that ever lived, of all the lands they have conquered, of all the places they have ruled. He is the, he is the greatest victor. He is the greatest one to triumph of any man. He triumphed over sin. He triumphed over the grave. He triumphed over death. He triumphed over the devil. He triumphed over that and gave us that great victory. But it's also the sign of a coming resurrection. Jesus is said to be the first fruits. And we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together. Amen. The dead in Christ shall rise first. That means our loved ones that have passed away are in the grave or wherever they're at, they're going to rise first. Then if we're alive, which I hope I'm alive, It'd be nice if Jesus came on Easter Sunday. Amen. That'd be a great ending to a message, amen, amen, that here he is again with us, and that one day we're going to be with him. Amen. We will be resurrected. We will be there with the Lord. A new body, glorified, immortal, incorruptible, eternal, that we will be there with our Lord forever and ever. At the military reviews of Peru, they had a great Admiral Gru who they honored as his greatest naval leader there in Chile. And always when they called the role that was there, the first name that was called was this great Admiral. And when his name was called, a soldier would step forward and say, absent but accounted for. Let me tell you, all of our saved loved ones that have died in Jesus Christ are absent but accounted for. They are absent from the body and present with the Lord. Uh, we did a couple of funerals, Sister Hassid Brock and, and Sister Tammy and those funerals that are there. A couple of years ago, my mom and dad. Several years ago, my wife's mom and dad. I'm glad today to know that one day, Jesus Christ is going to resurrect all saved people. Those that are dead in Christ, those that are alive in Christ, will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Dwight L. Moody, that great preacher, said, I like to think of the time when the dead shall rise from the grave. We read all these things and we call about a burial service. He said in the Bible it's not called a burial service. It's not a burial of a believer. But he said it is sown in dishonor, sown in weakness. He said the body of a saved believer is sown in the ground. He said if you bury something, that means you're done with it and it's not coming out again. But if he said you sow a seed in the ground, you're sowing that seed because you expect it to sprout and come up one day. Thank God, he says, our bodies have been sown in dishonor. They'll be raised in honor. Sown in weakness, they'll be raised in power. Sown a natural body, but raised a spiritual body, a body that will live and reign with him forever and ever. The mystery of the tomb. The meaning of the tomb. But think last of all about the message of of the tomb. In Matthew, when he talks to them, he says, go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen. Go tell them Jesus Christ is alive. The most important message we'll ever hear is that Jesus Christ is alive today, influencing many and giving power to many. The message 
of the empty tomb says this, there's a Savior to be praised. Thank God for my living Savior. His power, His person, His presence in our life. Go tell them, and they began to rejoice. There was a Savior to be praised. And not only that, there was a story to be preached, a story to be proclaimed. They went out and told that story about Jesus. What a glorious announcement and a fact. The Bible said to those disciples in Acts 1, you'll receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. Next time you read the book of Acts, underline or mark where it says risen, rose from the dead, the resurrection. The message of the early church was the resurrection of Jesus. Did it work? Peter preached it in Acts 2, preached the message only a few words, and 3,000 people got saved. In Acts 4, he preached, somebody preached it again, and 5,000 people got saved. You know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. It's a powerful, wonderful message. There's a Savior to be praised, a story to be proclaimed, and a service to be performed. Today, I tell you a good, great, and glorious story. Jesus is alive. When I got saved, Sunday became my favorite day of the week. And it's not a weekend day, I'll just tell you that. It's the first day of the week. But anyway, we won't go there. But anyway, uh, Sunday became my favorite day. Easter became my favorite Sunday of the year. I rarely sleep. I toss to and fro, keep my wife awake all night long. Finally, she looks over at me and said, don't you think it would be more comfortable on the couch? I said, well, maybe I would. <laughs> Subtle hints. Did you ever get that, man? Well, I'm excited. I'm glad. I have the greatest story ever told. I have the greatest good news ever given, the most glorious thing ever said. Jesus died, was buried, and he rose again. He did it for you and for you and for you and for you and for you. And you you that are watching online, he died for you. He suffered for you. He sacrificed for you. He became a substitute for you. Amen. He was buried, and thank God, he rose again. One of my favorite Sundays in the ministry was in 1978 on Easter Sunday. I went to a place called Glen Burnie, Maryland. How many of you know where Glen Burnie, Maryland is? How many of you know where Annapolis is at? Yeah, Annapolis. We know where that's at, training those people that are there. I went. I wasn't supposed to go. A preacher was supposed to go, got in an accident, he couldn't go. It was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday meeting. Be there on Friday, preach Saturday, preach Sunday, Easter Sunday. The preacher calls me, said, I can't make it, you got to go. I said, they never called me. He said, no, you're going in my place. Great. Second fiddle, second hand, doesn't matter. Uh, I went, had a great time. Got to see Annapolis go through that. I really enjoyed being there. Easter Sunday in Maryland was a little cooler than Easter Sunday in Florida. and It was a wonderful day. Easter Sunday morning, the building was packed like our church is today. So good to see them. That Sunday, between Sunday morning and Sunday night, we had eight people get saved. So that was a glorious Easter Sunday. We had two from the deaf ministry. They had an interpreter over here. I got fired up and got rolling down the road, and that interpreter looked at me like his tongue hanging out, like, can you slow down, preacher? When you have a deaf ministry, it's unusual. If you say something funny, the congregation laughs. Then they interpret it, and they laugh. Uh, uh, If you say something that's good, they'll rejoice. But we had a husband and a wife get saved. That was there. We had two other people get saved, but I had the most unusual thing ever happen in my ministry. Church was going, and the entrance came in this side door, like this door here. The auditorium was here, Sunday school rooms back there, so they had a side entrance. And you won't believe this, but as it got near to the beginning of the service, the only pews not occupied were the front pews. Now, you wouldn't believe that in a Baptist church, would you? 
Baptist churches fill up from the front to the back, right? Anyway, anyway, yeah, right. So four ladies came and sat where these four good-looking, available young men are at right over here. <laughs> I preached the message that morning just as I preached this message and told them about Jesus. One of the ladies came, another came, a couple came, the other lady came. All, all four of these ladies came to the altar. And they prayed and got saved. And after the service, a preacher said, Brother McGahee, you don't realize what just happened. And I said, I probably never realized how great it is for somebody to get saved. He said, this was a daughter, a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. You know what he said? They have been Roman Catholic all of their life. They thought by being a Catholic, by going to church, they were going to heaven. So they heard the gospel clearly today that it's not church, it's not religion, it's not baptism, it's not good works. It is the person of Jesus Christ. And they got gloriously saved. The empty tomb of Jesus proclaims to us that we have a risen and living Savior. And whoever you're hard to hear today and how you've come about being here, thank you. But are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ? He was born of a virgin came into this world as a man to live for us, hung on an old rugged cross to die for us, suffered the shame and humiliation for us, and he rose from the grave to give us a great salvation. Go, quickly tell his disciples, he is risen. He is risen. We serve a living Savior. And if you don't know him today, in a minute when we stand, come. Let us take the Bible and show you how you can be saved. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a Baptist. I'm not going to heaven because I got baptized. I'm not going to heaven because I've done some, maybe a couple good works along the way. I'm not going to heaven because of anything I've done. I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus Amen. did for me. Amen. Salvation is in a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And if you are saved today, remember and reflect on what he did for you and rejoice in a risen, living Savior. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Stand together, if you would, with me, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed, and you that are able to stand, thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here today, for listening to what I had to say. To really tell you what God's Word had to say today. And if you're here today and you're not saved and you've never been born again, we want to ask you just to step out where you're at. Come forward. And let's take the Bible and show you how you can be saved. A few weeks ago, we had several of our military, I think three, that stepped out and came. What a great day. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Can you point to a time and place in your life where you received Him? Do you know Him personally? He wants to know you. If you're watching online, you can be saved right there. A few weeks ago, we had a little eight-year-old girl get saved after our Sunday night broadcast. Realize you're a sinner. Realize Jesus Christ loves you, died, was buried, and rose again. Repent of your sins. Confess your sins to Him. Receive Him as your Savior, and you can be saved. God speaking to your heart, would you come? If you're a man and you're not sure, would you come? If you're a lady and you're not sure, would you come? Young person. Somebody in this building. The most important thing you'll ever know is knowing you are saved. Knowing you are a Christian. Knowing you are a child of God. It's what Easter's all about.
what the resurrection is all about, what church is all about, what Christianity is all about. It's telling other people about our wonderful, wonderful Savior. So today, if you're here and you don't know Him, would you come? Let's take the Bible and show you how you can be saved. Would you trust Him today? Would you receive Him today? Would you believe on Him? Watching online, you can be saved there. And if we are saved, if you are born again, realize there's a Savior to be praised. There's a story to be proclaimed. And there's a service to be performed. That is to preach and proclaim the gospel and good news of Jesus Christ, His power to save. Thank you, Lord, for everybody who has come to church this morning, everybody who has watched online. We appreciate them. And again, as pastor, I want to say thank you to all the music, the musicians, and everything that was done, the choir, the congregation, the prelude, the offertory, uh, all, all the music and the special song to touch our hearts about you and what you did for us. I pray you would take the truth of this simple message with anybody here in church or watching online that's not saved. Don't let them end this day. Don't let them leave church without trusting in you. For we who are saved, may we rejoice when we remember what you did for us and reflect on that great day in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for being here. We appreciate your kindness and honoring us with your presence today. And we're certainly glad for you being here with us today. Choir tonight? It's the ladies at 5 o'clock. Ladies at 5 o'clock for choir. Uh, 545 prayer meeting or service at 6. Tonight, after our regular service, we'll be observing communion or the Lord's Supper. We try to do this every Easter Sunday. Uh, Wednesday night, our regular service, we'll have a business meeting. And then uh, Thursday, visitation in the nursing home. Saturday, door-to-door -door visitation. Uh, remind you of that. Next Sunday night, we're going to have a special treat. Uh, Brother and Sister Rogers will be here with us. Uh, he plays the piano. They sing. Uh, he preaches, and it'll be a great service. So they're going to be with us today. Uh, you'll get a real blessing. So plan on next Sunday night being with us because it will really be good. Now, Sister Charity Root's going to be out front. Uh, she's got a backdrop, some stools. So if you'd like to have a picture, uh, if you want an individual uh, shot, you can get that. Uh, husband and wife, you can get that. Family, you can get that. However you would like to do it. So we thank Miss Charity for doing this. And she offers this to all of you. We did it Christmas, and a lot of people enjoyed it. Uh, so today, if you'd like to get that, a little memento. And I'll tell you what, if you go to a studio, try to get a portrait taken. It costs more than $5. $50. But anyway, thanks for coming. Glad that you're here today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. And as we are dismissed today, uh, Brother Olson, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?